I've got an amazing guest in studio right now uh, for a conversation on uh, something that is very, very developmental um, in our world being in society. And uh, my guest is none other than uh, Samantha, uh, who now joins me, Samantha Murozoki. I hope I said that correct. Well and correct. Uh, awesome. Uh, good morning, Samantha, and welcome to Morning Rush. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Now, Samantha is a founder of Uchengetana Trust, and she also happens to be a lawyer. Now, this is her amazing story. When COVID-19 was right at, at its peak in 2020, she went on uh, a project to feed those that were in need, and uh, she ended up feeding thousands in the process, and that then became the genesis of uh, this amazing Uchengetana Trust. Now, uh, Samantha, may you speak to um, how you uh, got about starting this uh, initiative and uh, what inspired you to reach out at such a critical stage of uh, uh, the development of the narrative of Zimbabweans? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, Kuchengetana Trust was not premeditated. Uh, it just started because uh, my maternal instincts kicked in. Uh, because I had heard one child that was crying next door saying they hadn't eaten yesterday. Uh, knowing that uh, during the lockdown many people were not allowed to go and work and majority of the people in the area have to go and work on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to buy food or basics. So when I heard this boy cry, and then I decided, okay, I can share the food that I had. So from sharing the food that I had, uh, we realized that there were about 10, 12 more people. Then we decided that, okay, uh, we'll serve 15, me and my little sister. So 15 turned into 24 on the first day, and ever since then, we never looked back. Look, but uh, um, I, I came across an article uh, about you where you ended up f feeding about 3,000 um, in the process. How did you perform such a feat? Okay, so when the numbers were doubling per day, by uh -huh. the time we reached two weeks, we were already serving about 1,800. 1,800. Yes. And then the word started to spread into Seke Rural, uh, Zengeza, and, and so forth. Then our numbers hit an all-time 4,500. 4,500 people. Yes, that's the number we're serving per day for quite a, quite a bit. But at that time, it was, it was, it was practical for us because... Uh, the the community had intervened, Chitungweza, the Zimbabwe, and even the international community had chipped in. So it was it was a workable experience because we're getting help from all forts of the world. Wow, um, yes. absolutely um, amazing and uh, very very uh, you know um, comforting knowing that we've got such kind of people in our yes. communities that care about the well-being of others. Now you've undertaken some community building, uh, capacity building initiatives um, of late. Would you want to speak to that? Yes. So uh, I realized that uh, as much as feeding is a noble mm -hmm. uh, way of doing things or right. reaching out to the community, but uh, in the in the same in the same way it becomes more of an enabling setup. So I didn't want to to be blamed for people being lazy because for as long as you eat really there's not much you can worry about. So I decided that maybe we need to capacitate, give capacity to uh, the parents of our recipients or or the community that is not really doing much. So we decided to start with our um, our basic uh, capacity building where we teach them how to make your candles, your washing powder, your cordial drinks, and uh, also giving the, getting uh, professionals that uh, can give them pep talks to say, now that you can make a product, mm -hmm. you can make your candles, how are you then going to handle your business going forth? Uh, how will you interact with people? How will you save money? How are you going to empower yourself and move yourself from a place of... Uh, being given donations on a daily basis to a place where you are now earning an income and decide for yourself that, oh, today I want to have eggs. Oh, today I want my child to go to church and not to come and queue for food at Kuchingetana Trust. So we've been pushing that agenda for, for about a couple of years now. And uh, whilst at it, we've been doing um, our anti-drug campaign. We work mainly with children 16 years and below. Uh, um, look, um, this is a very um, sensitive subject, especially where young people are concerned in this country, yes. considering the fact that about 25% of our youth um, 
are hooked on to drugs um, in one form or the other. Uh, you know, what does this mean and what sort of initiatives are you taking and how are you tackling the subject of substance abuse? Yes. So um, the, the initiative came up from interacting with these children on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh -huh. I'm talking of children uh, to as young as four years old who have been exposed to uh, drug abuse one way or the other. So when you're feeding them, you notice uh, the pattern that, oh, for example, Tendai is acting a little bit different today. Uh, today, uh, Yesterday he was uh, on a high note, today he's on a low note. You see his eyes, you see his demeanor. Uh -huh. So then we realized that we had children that were exposed to, to drugs, especially uh, in our kitchens in Epworth. Okay. So we decided that we needed to talk to them and hear what they say about it. So we sat down and would ask them, what do you know about drugs? They told me about drugs that I didn't even know existed. They have uh, code names or, or, or nicknames for them. They'll, you can even get drugs made from your regular Zepnex or Nicknex and you ferment it and all that stuff. These are kids in grade one, two, or grade seven telling me this. So I realized that we had a problem and the best way we could start is at home. When I say home, I mean Kuchingetana Trust. I have to start working with my children first before we then go out and preach about uh, an anti-drug campaign. Mm -hmm. So we've been working incessantly uh, at making sure that uh, they, they know the, 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 the disadvantages of, of relying on such a lifestyle and giving them other options, making them see that it's possible for them to dream because they're 16 and below. The least you can do is dream because when you're done dreaming, then it will solidify into a reality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're working at that as well. All right. Now, yes. um, let's talk about your plans for the future with uh, Kuchengetana Trust. You started off feeding, um, uh, you know, the vulnerable when COVID was right at its peak. Yes. And uh, now you are empowering youths and helping them navigate and uh, teaching them some, some life skills and helping them deal with the cancerous um, drug abuse that bedevils Zimbabwe at this yeah. point. So what then becomes the strategy and the focal point going forward? Yes, um, I believe that when people have uh, capacity, mm -hmm. they have uh, goals, they have a drive, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it clearly becomes a tunnel vision uh, effort for them to say, I want to reach the next point of betterment. So um, we came out, we uh, in partnership with uh, an organization in the United Kingdom called Tools with a Mission, uh, managed to get a few machines, sewing machines, uh, mm -hmm. welding machines. We got our knitting machines mm, uh, with, with the plans of uh, creating somewhat of a vocational center uh -huh, uh -huh. so that people gain capacity. So when we're done training them, say, for example, uh, my Tandio is training uh, to, to sew yeah. for the duration of the year until she yeah. gains capacity. When we say she's qualified and she's graduating, then with tools with a mission, we make sure that she has a parting gift of that sewing machine or whatever wow. trade that she was learning, and then she goes along her way, and then we do our monitoring um, or our evaluation post-qualification uh, to see how she's doing, and also so that she knows that she has the pressure to deliver, and cr that's creating a, a, a culture of um, accountability, a culture of self-sustainability, and hoping that it works out. So, so this is where... You... So, so this goes just beyond aid, but it also uh, moves into empowering someone to yes. actually be fit for trade, as it were. C correct. And uh, also at, at, the, at the kitchens, because uh, food insecurity is, is probably going to be a thing that exists in our communities. I mean, in any, even in the first world, uh, food insecurity is there in certain, in certain aspects. So we, are also, we also have uh, completed our, our, our styes, we have pig styes, uh, which we might convert into uh, our chicken coops, so because we want to have a decent menu for the children because you're coming to queue for food doesn't mean that every single day you have to eat salsa and, and, and chunks, salsa and chunks. We want to make it varied so that there's eggs, there's also chicken, uh, possibly get some livestock, get some milk for the children and make it varied so that we also gain sustenance as a trust and we don't have to be fully reliant on donations. 
Right. Now, yes. Samantha, it's a women's month, and uh, uh, women are taking the center stage, um, and uh, there's several issues to address and talk about where women are actually concerned with the work that you're doing. Um, what aspect of addressing the challenges that women face do you think needs to be paid attention the most? I think the just the operating environment that we have uh, is um, is quite competitive, for lack of a better word. Okay. So for us to stand out as women, or for us to effectively uh, stand or be the backdrop as women, we need to be we need to have a concerted effort, uh, not to see each other as competition but to see each other as a building block. Because from one stage to the other, we need, we need each other to have two stages, for example. So um, my word to women like me or women who are aspiring to, to grow and reach higher... To scale the heights. Higher. By the way, you are a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and uh, what, has that, what has that meant, um, given uh, you, how you have navigated your journey um, as a legal expert? Okay, uh, so me being a lawyer exposed me to the, um, to the world of philanthropy whilst I was in South Africa uh -huh. because uh, we used to do uh, our legal clinic, which means that you go out pro bono, you're assisting people, and that's how I saw that the culture of helping and the culture of loving one another is quite on a, another level in South Africa. So that's where I learned, that's where it comes from. And I was in immigration, so I'm an immigration lawyer by trade. And coming to Zimbabwe, uh, that has actually boosted me because my interpersonal skills, communication and identifying problems uh, or uh, stiff situations is, is, is quite easy for me because I have, uh, I have the experience. And uh, well, I really am not really applying the immigration part of it because it's got nothing to do with, with philanthropy, but I think it, it, it just instilled a culture of um, of knowing that you have to give back to the community. Prime, DSTV Channel 294, the place to be.